Hello, hello, good morning, everyone. I have a great guest today. Uh, my name is Charles McNamara, <clears throat> here with Guardian Group Services. First in many that we're planning to do, uh, we're going to have a really, really good podcast that goes off. Uh, this session is going to be Meet the Instructors. And today, I have a great guest with me. Um, you know, we want to make sure people know the training staff talk a little bit about their backgrounds, uh, where they're from, what they do, what they teach. Um, and one of the most important things I thought are, what are some common traits of a great instructor? And, you know, I thought, you know, for a great instructor, yeah. person has to be confident, innovative, uh, and most importantly, humble. Uh, they are going to be presenting information to individuals. Um, and communication skills are a very very big deal and you know today's guest I want to welcome instructor john how are you i'm fine thank you very much good morning good morning good morning so you know i got a you know a couple of bag of tricks with me today um but i wanted to talk a little bit about you you know i'm a trainer as well but you know it's not about me today uh it's about you so tell the people a little bit about yourself where you're from, how long you've been teaching. We'll kind of get into some uh, numbers as well. Okay, uh, good morning. Yeah, um, like um, Charles said, my name's uh, John Levinas, and uh, I've been an instructor now, I guess, going on about 15 years. And um, I started, I became an instructor through the uh, New York City um, Department of Probation. Um, I worked there for uh, going on, I guess, pretty much 30 years. So, um, kind of show, kind of shows that I'm, you know, been around for a while and, uh, <laughs> I did different things in the department, um, you know, like everybody else. And then, you know, you get transferred or you may see an opening, um, in a different location or a different borough. Uh, everybody wants to be kind of closer to home. So they try to, uh, eventually you have no choice at first. You go where you're assigned and that's the way it goes. But as, as years go on, um, you know, people, uh, you start to put in for transfers. Um, if you have, you know, a, a halfway decent reputation, we'll say, then some of the bosses are not uh, adverse to you coming to work for them. So sure. as I started off in a, in a general, super, what they call at that time, general supervision in 1991 um, in Brooklyn, uh, not far from Court Street, it was on Geralman Street. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for three years, and then um, I went to Manhattan. I had put into work in the um, Warren Squad, oh, so nice. I went there and I I worked on you know I worked there for eight years, um, days, and then eventually um, when I took the uh, supervisor's examination, I got promoted, and then to, then you go again wherever you're needed. So they needed me in a program called uh, Night Watch. Um, so I worked nights um, in Manhattan, and that was um, citywide, you know, responding to citywide warrants. Um, and I then I worked in a sex. Uh, then after a while, um, things changes uh, in a mayoral agency. Um, you end up you have new commissioners come in with new administrations, and you find yourself, you know, adjusting. And I was then transferred to work. Um, in the sex offender unit for the next three years in Queens, which I had lived in Queens. So I was, and days now, now I was working days and I was newly married. So I was very, that was in 1998. I was very happy. <laughs> moving <to>. moving <laughs> on up in the world, huh? <laughs> yeah, so, I, so <laughs> I lived in Kew Gardens Hills and I worked out of Jamaica. So it was a brief, you know, 10 minute, 15 minute car ride. Um, no bridges or anything like that. So I, I was 
I was happy to do that. And about three years into it, one of my bosses was uh, a firearms instructor, almost like per diem. I mean, mm -hmm. he was a, a branch chief. And um, he said to me, you know, there's going to be openings in the training unit. People are retiring. You know, you might want to consider that, John. And at first I was like, oh, I don't know. And, you know, getting up in front of an audience and speaking. And, you know, I wasn't all that confident that, at that time. So, but I put in for it and um, I was fortunate. I, I got chosen and they sent me to a lot of training. Training is key um, to constantly to grow. And I- Absolutely. I had to get a I had to get my certificate um, through the uh, police academy in the um, NYPD, and then um, eventually I became a uh, firearms instructor um, out in Southampton Beach in Long Island. Awesome. Well, that's how I basically did it. It was piecemeal by piecemeal. <laughs> you know? So you currently teach the armed and unarmed portions of the security guard program. Yes, I do, I and that was what was great about getting the um, pardon me the uh, DCJS. Uh, certificate uh, uh, through the police department was then I somebody said well why don't you become a security guard uh, instructor at that time the licenses were free so I had nothing I had nothing to lose I sent the proper certificates uh, to um, you know DCJS and they they send them back and they're good for five years now you now they're now that you have to pay for them but yeah. it doesn't that's okay that's fine so um, it was a great way to continue doing something I really enjoy. Yeah, you time. started to talk about something, and I'm, I'm going to bring up some quick numbers um, through Lorman. You know, it's a great training network for, um, for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, the link and the information will be in the description later on, but it's uh, lorman.com. You know, when we talk about training, um, you know, I think everybody can agree. They probably have had at least one instructor where it's just... Oh my gosh, is this guy going to wrap this thing up soon? This is sure. so boring. I can't, you know, stand it. It's not for me. Um, but I was surprised, you know, with some numbers here that um, just shocked me. And as we go through them, uh, I'm pretty sure you can attest this. Nearly 59% of employees claim they had no workplace training for their skills. And most of these things that they learned were self taught, just institutional knowledge. Um, which I find that a little scary, you know, especially in the security guard industry. And uh, another number that just kind of blew my mind yesterday when I was going through this again, 74% of workers are willing to learn uh, new skills or retrain to remain employed. And, you know, you kind of think about, you know, why people train. And we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, why people train. In our line of work, um, you know, first responders, security, uh, law enforcement, military, it's its a requirement. You have to train. If it ain't raining, you ain't training, right? It's the old saying, but a lot of people want to learn. They want to know how to do their job effectively. Right. And, you know, this, this one, common sense. Organizations with poor onboarding processes are twice as likely to experience employee turnover. You know, um, you got to start them off on the right foot. You know, a lot of companies have the attitude well you know i need somebody and i gotta get them out to work but that initial onboarding process is so important um, to the growth of the individual as well as the company so i kind of wanted to you know get into a couple of questions here uh the first one being why were you interested in becoming an instructor what sparked the motivation within you well you, you know it was i i also you know all those years of you know the kind of work that i that i did um as you say I, I learned a lot of skills as as i went along and i thought at, as you start getting a little older um you know younger people are coming on to kind of do a lot of the a lot of the hands-on things that's just from my own personal perspective so i figured if i already have this knowledge base and i'm a supervisor and now i'm kind of tethered to the office, we'll say, and only coming out um, of the office on emergencies. Uh, most of the time, I, my, field, my field work days were done, but, you know, you still would get called out on emergency calls. Um, you know, when that was proposed to me, I hadn't really thought much about it. Mm. And it just, it, it really sparked my interest. And then with discussions with, with him, because he was already an instructor on the firearms end. And he said, you know, John, um, you know, you might want to be able to pass on 
you know, some of the, the things you've learned and some of the tips, even the skills. I, I, I still try to do that even when we, we do the security guard classes, because, you know, there's a, a base of knowledge, you know, that, that the, everybody has to learn to get their certificates. You try to give them a little something else, you know, some like tips. I, I, it may sound not much, but have a flashlight. Um, know how to use emergency equipment, things like that. How to mm -hmm. how to how to speak to people. How to adjust your body because I would run into some trouble with that when um, we had um, some newer officers would come into that uh, particular kind of unit at the time, and they were very gung ho to. And I get it, you know, everybody you know wants to do their job, but sometimes. I try to impart to them because as a supervisor, you're training anyway. That's your responsibility. Mm -hmm. So if I'm out in the car riding with, with new officers um, in the field, you know, I would just, I know they're nervous. They don't want to show it. Everybody, you know, was nervous the first time they're going to knock on the door and look, look for somebody. But sometimes less was more, if that makes any sense, where, yeah. you know, you speak to people, you, you, whether it's mom or whoever comes to the door, a friend, a, a spouse, and try to get the person to cooperate before things could escalate into something and it's the same thing in security work you know it's um you know customer service based um you're, still, you're dealing with people um if i was dealing with civilians they weren't on you know they weren't on probation you know their son or their husband was and you would try to get them to, to see that it was in their best interest to have that particular person to cooperate um, say like going to court wise, because it's much easier to tell a judge that somebody voluntarily, somebody voluntarily surrendered than they were hiding, uh, in the back bedroom on the, a pile of clothing. And, you know, it doesn't look the, the judge, uh, the, especially back those days, they, they didn't look too kindly on that. So, yeah. no, you know, those kinds of things, you, your, your, your mouth is a, is a much be better, uh, tool on your tool belt to use, um, then if you have to reach for your other tools, if that makes sense, if that, you know, if you know where I'm going, you know? Absolutely does. It kind of like segues into the next question, right? Everybody's got their little like tips and tricks and tools, right? There are standardized procedures, I think, pretty much for most jobs, you know, within this industry, right. um, you know, kind of get an, how did you become an instructor? What was that process like? Like, how did you actually train? Uh, I know for me, it, it was done through a private organization. Um, DCJS was present. And a lot yes. of it was hands-on. Um, you know, today we yes. do a lot of things kind of online, but some training has to be done, you know, in sure. person, online. So what was your process like to become an instructor? Okay, so to become an instructor, um, I basically went into the U office and I was allowed to take part in trainings that were not, you know, that didn't, I guess that didn't, um, you didn't need your DCJS certification at that point. Mm -hmm. So if it was in-house trainings, um, things were, when I first got on board, uh, I'll just jump to that real quick, when 1991, when I went through training, it was not as in depth as it is now. Now it's very, it's very structured. There's a real concrete, um, core group of people that provide the trainings over and over and over um dcjs says you have to do this whether it's peace officer training um firearms all has to be done by dcjs um, certified instructors um if you teach fundamentals we'll say of probation there's also one besides having that training now which they up they used to have a thing called anchor training so i had to go up to albany and stay up there for two weeks and get their training on how they wanted a statewide base that every department, because it's always, um, you know, Nassau, Suffolk, mm -hmm. Buffalo, wherever the case may be, they wanted everybody to have that core training. So you had to do, I had to do this thing, was called the anchor training for two weeks, stay quiet, you know, um, observe, do all these different things. Then I had to come back and give a presentation in front of the DCJS um, instructors live. So I, then I had to drive back up to Albany and and give a give a say like a one hour piece where they kind of just would give you tips and say, okay, you did this well, you might not have done this that well. That's part of life. I mean, you know, you have to be able to take criticism, you know, and um, and then you go back and you would incorporate this in, into your regular job. And 
that was a big help to me, you know, eventually teaching the security guard courses, um, because then the, the state will provide you, right, with, with what exactly needs to be, the, be, the minimum. So what they do now is they've incorporated a lot of other things into it, like conflict. You know, I didn't really teach that myself, but they incorporated things like conflict resolution and some computer-based trainings to enhance the skills. So they stay there for, I guess it's about six, eight weeks, something like that. And because then, then the state says, you know, you have to have firearms training, you have to have defensive tactics training. Um, so there's that. And then whatever piece the department wanted to add on, or even in security guard trainings, if you want to add other pieces in, that's fine. But there is that minimum standard. So I was introduced little by little because they have to see how you work, um, how you operate, and then you get more and more responsibility as time goes on, you know? Absolutely. You know, this question, um, you know, for me, it was funny because obviously, you know, being from the military, you know, when we go through basic, there's a whole bunch of little different types of training. Um, you know, I just kind of grabbed from each of them uh, because I actually did my instructorship with DCJS along with uh, the Red Cross. I was trying to get like three different licenses to teach all at the same time. So I was doing security training, firearms training. I was doing CPR and first aid, like kind of all around the same time. So, you know, I think you know, when you talk about the ideal officer, they should be able to grab, you know, from different areas. You know, they may be posted in a corporate high rise office building. Uh, they might be, you know, um, <laughs> responsible just for patrols, but things change um, and they change very quickly. Um, how did your previous work experience prepare you for the role as an instructor? Um, yeah, I mean, because it, it, it was like little bases of knowledge that went along. Now, I, I, I learned a lot. Of, I also learned a lot um, becoming a security guard. You know, I still have my security guard license. I don't really do much of it anymore, but to bolster my income. And that's what I try to tell the class. I say, because some people, you know, I, if, I'll ask people if it's a smaller class, you know, if they don't mind, you know, what are you doing now? And you find a lot of times young people will say, oh, I'm going to, you know, Queensborough College or I'm going to St. John's or something like that. And I'll say, okay, so it's, it's great because you can do part-time roles. Mm -hmm. um, I had a waiver, you know, I had a, a, a waiver to become a security uh, uh, officer and you know with basically no security officer training so what i did find was a lot of the uh, the new officers um you know they they kind of are coming from almost like this law enforcement aspect and you learned quickly from you know uh, i was working uh, a lot of stuff on fashion week and uh the owner was a a friend of mine from work who had uh retired and opened up his own security company at that time and you learned it's, you know, we're customer based. So the, so when I did see any kind of uh, issues, it was with um, sometimes people becoming a little overboard. And uh, so you had to learn that way. That's why I, I make sure I always tell the class how important it is to take these classes and how I learned a lot from, you know, teaching them to actually see you know, actually seeing in my face the, the curriculum and studying it and say, oh, OK. And that's that's that whole should you get a waiver? Should you not get a waiver? Uh, that kind of thing. So I learned a lot by teaching the courses also. I, I would totally agree. That was me um, when I first got out of the military, um, you know, late 90s. I was that gun ho kid like, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And in the middle of a, you know, lobby, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You know, and literally anybody that walks by, I need your ID. I need your ID. I need your ID. You know, the yeah. owner's like, chill out, relax. You're, you know, it's a different environment. And, you know, that's important and giving the right guidance. And, you know, I was fortunate enough. Um, I just skipped the question. Sorry. You know, having a positive influence um, in your career. I was lucky enough to have really good, you know, security managers and directors of security and really good trainers. I went to a lot of different training courses with, you know, different intents, just learning material. Um, but I was given the opportunity um, to be in a lot of different hands on type of training classes, as well as, um, you know, studies and case studies and reviews. Uh, so I've had a lot of positive influences in, in my career. Um, what about for you? Who has been the most positive influence in your career? 
Um, I would have to say uh, I had quite a few. I mean, um, even to when I first, you know, went to work for the city, my friend's dad was a um, was a deputy inspector in the uh, the NYPD, and I never met a person who had such a calm, quiet, humble demeanor. And he would always give me words of encouragement. Or if I had questions about work, I was very, I felt very confident asking him, you know, almost like some of the, you know, even some of the legal questions, you mm -hmm. know, because on his level, I, I knew he knew all the legalities. And one of the things he had said was, you have to, a lot of times, you know, dealing with people is to go slow. And that's whether it's, you know, a law enforcement position or a security guard, people know that you're coming from that position, right? From a position of authority. And you can speak to them before things, you know, before things escalate. And he would give me, you know, you know, some graphic uh, details I don't have to go into on cases, but, you know, to, to elicit information from people, just would have conversations with them. And these were people, you know, and it was the same thing with when I, when I worked. So every area I went to, I would always try to, I was fortunate, I should say, I, I, I had supervisors who were really hands-on with teaching, teaching me things or teaching the others, or we would have, you know, weekly meetings where we would all sit inside and, and discuss cases. And that is specific to one thing, but it's the same thing in, in, in a security industry that you know, it's okay, even after an event that maybe didn't go so well. Um, so I would, when I went to the security uh, uh, positions, I would make sure that I would I would seek out even officers who would say, okay, this is how this works, because occasionally you wouldn't get a lot of, you know, a lot of feedback. And you wanted to kind of reach out with people who had a base of knowledge of where sure. you're going. And to, you know, so, that's what I basically look for. I had so many of them. I had, I had like I said, I had, I had a supervisor, Elisa Trillo. And when I went to that Warren squad, uh, we'll say, you know, I didn't know anything about that kind of work, Charlie. I, I was, you know, like anybody else, I showed up and I was nervous and this is what's going to go on. And then you find out it was, they would hook you up with somebody who had a lot of experience and you would mm -hmm. learn from that person. Uh, I worked with a person, uh, Hector Benitez, and we, you know, um, he nice and easy he would tell me things and take me on easy cases, if that made any sense, you know, sure. just watch how he interacted with people and spoke with them. So I learned a lot from a lot of people, you know, that were, were great helps to me. Very you know, I, I think that's so important, um, you know, especially for <laughs> new officers or maybe um, younger officers just getting into the industry or those who don't have a lot of exposure to different things is kind of bringing them up along the ranks as well. You know, I think, you know, with the information age today, you know, people are just, you know, you don't know something, go Google it. Like, calm down. Let me help you find it. Let me help you figure that out. There's something about training when it's that aha moment where someone now finally gets it. Um, you know, it, it's very, you know, life changing. And it could be something small. You know, I love doing CPR classes because most of the people that do it, it's mandatory for their job but they tell me hey charlie you know i'm so glad that i took this class because if something happens to uh, my mother or my father or or my child i'm glad that i have this skill um you know to go help and in the industry there's things that change from time to time you know we talk about the security guard act of 1992 a mm -hmm. lot in our training you think about it you know this is has been standardized throughout the years but how do you stay up to date with different trends in the industry or um, what kind of knowledge do you read um well that's th the great thing now with uh you know with with being able to go on things like youtube or um look for trainings you know look for trainings mm -hmm. online um so i try i try to look into that i was i was looking last night actually at um I was trying to locate the DCJS calendar because sometimes you can, I'm, I'm oh, a civilian, yeah. right? I'm, I'm a retired civilian, but sometimes they may offer other courses where you can really keep abreast of, of, of um, things that change, things that may be changed in the law. Um, you know, some, I still have friends who, who are instructors uh, still working um, in the department and they'll tell me, oh, since you've left, which has been five years now going on, 
this is this has changed. So instead of getting, I think it was at that time it was say three days of peace officer training. Now it's like two weeks, and that comes from DCJS. So their instructors had to be sent up back up to Albany to actually learn. So things you have to keep, you know, abreast of stuff like that. So I will I will Google things like. And you try to find it. it's not always that easy, but you have to put in, you know, changes in Article 35 or changes as per, you know, you know, the state of New York, whatever. So you you, you need to kind of try your best, um, you know, when you're doing instructions. It's not to stay get stale, I guess, if that's the word. Yeah, um, it, 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 you hit something right on on the money that um, you know talk about. If we took the syllabus from 1992 and tried to apply it today right very different you know the way that we do patrols right you know back in the day the old you know uh dtex wand sure. you know a lot of the stuff now is just qr code so the fundamentals are the same but the way that we roll it out and do it can be different computerized training is very very you know big now a lot of the uh, big companies still do you know blocks of training and it's all online you know um you got to switch it up a little bit and you know with us here in our world at guardian group services we pivoted a lot of our training online um, which we were approved by dcjs so i'd love to know your thoughts on um, in-person training to online training courses what are your thoughts well i think as 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 technology has really improved um like what we're doing today that uh the zoom wise you can interact with people um pretty well uh remotely um mm -hmm. i did something to somebody the other day and the person was from niagara falls so <laughs> I, I was like oh niagara falls you know <laughs> you know obviously they, they weren't coming down to manhattan uh so you can reach out to a large base of people um with this current technology certain classes of course um you're going to have to do you know face to face um mm -hmm. like do the firearms um uh parts you know you have to do live fire so you have to be there. I'm doing something uh, for the Nassau County range, whatever, on Sunday. That's a requirement. It's a federal thing. You have to be there for live stuff. But I'm I'm starting to even in my mind, cons you know, thinking that why can't a lot of the class, if say the class is 47 hours for the armed guard, right? 47 hours. That's a lot of hours. And to try to get, you know, to try to get people to say, oh, well, you know, you have to come in, you know, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. Next thing you know, oh, I'd like to take the course, but you know, I I'm working overnight. You know, a lot of guys, you know, they're already doing their security jobs or for the. Mm -hmm. well, you you start to say, you know, how much of this could actually be done, provided the person, the people are paying attention. Yes. So you're talking, you know, a lot about safety, uh, which is of the, you know, with that sort of thing. But you start to say, how much of this can actually be done, um, like online, to maybe save them that trip to driving. You know, to arrange to sit in the in the classroom section, and then meet up for some of the hand-on skills. You know, move it around. So, but again, the state would have to. The state of New York hasn't approved that. Mm -hmm. you never know if it's if it's when it's when things are brought up to people, they'll say, you know what, we could look at, we could look into that. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I think it's great. Yeah, I, I try to look at, you know, all sides, you know, as an instructor, does this work? Does a student understand the material I'm trying to give them? So, you know, there's some things right. that absolutely can be transitioned online. You know, it's funny because uh, they're not a sponsor, but, um, you know, Mantis, they make, yes. you know, a great training tool, which I think, um, you know, you right. and I have talked about offline, yes. Yes. Uh, you know, range time is expensive um yeah, you know yes. taking the drive you know purchasing ammunition can get expensive yeah. so you know a, a tool like this you know yeah. these are the idpa targets um mantis you know not a sponsor but if they'd like to sponsor us i'd love that you know it's a great training tool sure. um, but once again right you have to do the physical skill right. um you know one of the things that you know it's funny because i still have this to this day uh this book is probably about 20 years old now uh training for dummies right i use this as an instructor um training design um training cycles what works why adults learn how do adults learn um you know in our world you know we are mostly training individuals 18 and above um you know uh, people learn differently 
right? So some people like visuals, right? They, they like a picture of something, right? So I could say, you know, you're aiming for this area, um, but now go out and do it totally different, right? I have to teach you how do you do that? Sure. Could be something as easy, and I get this a lot, which is pretty funny. You got to sign everybody in. Okay, how do I do that? Well, just go to the computer. Well, well what do you mean? Well, you got to, how do you do that? Go put your password in, go put your name. Now, yeah. how do you sign them in? Maybe you have to physically take an ID and scan it. So sometimes, you know, an, an easy question is really not that easy. No, but as instructors, skills. yeah, we have to be able to, you know, give that person the feedback if they're not understanding it, um, you know, to reach that desired goal. You know, me personally, over the years um, for security training, fire safety training, CPR, OSHA, defensive driving. You know, when I was writing this out, I was like, let me just do a rough estimate. I have probably taught over 10,000 students um, for yeah. the past 20 years. Um, you know, and it just hit me like, wow, that, that's a lot of people that I touched. One of the great things, you know, as you mentioned, what we're doing here on, on, uh, on the YouTube podcast is I want to be able to have a space where I can kind of park this video and future videos where people can get those skill sets, get information, you know, quick bits um, and tips, mm -hmm. sure. um, you know, so, you know, if they need just to kind of review something or just get a different point of view, uh, I'd, you know, love to have that information here. Uh, how many students do you think you've trained roughly? I was, uh, yeah, it, it's got to be kind of in that same ballpark because I was, you know, when I think about it, you know, my job had a relatively small department, right? It's, it's, it's not, you know, it doesn't have 25,000 officers like the police department, but, you know, generally speaking, 1,500, 2,000, something like that. But, you know, they have firearms. And um, like I say, things were not as they are now. You know, when I started, say, like pepper spray, I started, they were like, here's a canister of mace. <laughs> you can't carry mace anymore. Here's a canister of mace. And this is what you do. You just, and of course they're showing you the wrong way to do things. Yeah. And you just carry that with you. You know, thank God I never had to deploy it. But then I became a, a, a pardon me, chemical, no, uh, pepper spray instructor, excuse me. And, and they said to me, okay, John, you're going to do the whole department. So I did that for months. And, you know, so gosh, maybe 40, 40 a day for a year. And that was one training. And then the same thing with, 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 with firearms. When I first started it, it wasn't mandatory. Um, and all of a sudden it became mandatory that everybody had to have firearms training. So they had the DCJS to go back and train every single officer. So that was a whole new thing. You were getting people who were, who were not young and that went on for months and months. So it, like you say, it had to be thousands and, different trainings I, not, I you know stay away from the firearms talk but you know mental health everybody had you know mental health substance abuse i taught those two courses too um so everybody would come and come in for all of these so it was, like you say it was in it was in the thousands and you don't think about it as you're doing it but when you're assigned to train that's that's your job you know yeah, and yeah. 40 50 people sometimes when they want to do things quickly to catch up to speed a class of 15 all of a sudden it's, it's a class when allowed by the state because the state also dictates how many people You're could be in specific, yep. specific trainings right mm -hmm. you, know, you can't stick 50 people in there for for whatever but but things that were open-ended like a mental health like a mental health first aid or or anything like that it was okay to have 50 people so it wasn't just myself you know i would on that side of size trainings i'd have two two or three instructors and we would take we would take a block but then usually you sat in anyway. When your block was done, you didn't just leave the room. Most of the time you sat and watched because there could come the time and it has happened. So-and-so called in sick. So we need you to we need you to teach their part. Oh, I'm not comfortable. We need you to teach their part. <laughs> so get comfortable hurry, quick. You have an hour hurry to hurry up and get comfortable. Yep. Yeah, you have an hour <laughs> to study uh their piece, and then at 10 o'clock, uh, you're going on for two hours. And you know, you had to learn and adjust. So it's, uh, it was kind of, it, it, it was really great, you know, um, and to see people. Mm -hmm. A lot of people come, you know, when they come in for training, particularly if they've been, you know, onboarded, they've been there for years. And sometimes they're like, oh, I gotta do this again. And I gotta take right in the city, right to no training, right? Yes. I have to, <laughs> I have to take right to no training. 
I'm sorry, but that's a New York City requirement. And, you know, I tried to, you know, make it fun with them and, and, and go through things. And like I say, to be humble, because there were people sitting out in that audience when I would teach specific courses that I knew they had a tremendous base of knowledge. And, you know, beyond, beyond myself, and I was never ashamed to, to say that. But I'd say there were people here who were starting from square one. And that's a lot of times who I'm addressing. If you have a lot of skill, same way doing the annuals, the eight hour annuals, please feel free to raise your hand. Give us some scenarios you've encountered that everybody can learn from, if you're comfortable with that, that I can learn from. That's You have to remain teachable even as an instructor because uh, as you say, being in the service or whatever, there's a lot of a lot of people with a lot of a lot of background, and you know they can be a big part. And sometimes even adjunct, we would bring people into adjunct things. Yep. The times. Yeah, I'm I'm an adjunct at CUNY, and you know That's most awesome. of those students are like Charlie. I've been doing this for 25, 30, 40 years. I've been doing this job longer than you've been alive. Right. You know, so I I agree. Like, hey, listen, I know that. Tell me what you got. You know, let's run through some mm -hmm. scenarios. What what do you got going on? Um, continuing education or professional development anything you know in your future that you're considering um looking into or taking part of yeah i i i, I try to look at things that i'm you know you try to fit into your schedule um i think it's called flexi um mm -hmm. but a lot of times those are you know those are great courses there's in other states but i also will look locally um sometimes you, you know they may have like an, an, an additional instructor course or or, or a firearms course. I'm, I'm looking to possibly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, like I say, I'm now I'm trying to look on the DCJ, DCJS website if there's something I could maybe possibly go away for a day or two um, that fits my home schedule. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To go yeah. to go up to Albany because they, you know, the, their trainers up there, um, the DCJS are, 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 you know, I know some of them. Uh, I did. If they're still there, I don't know. <laughs> but they were excellent. And some of the local you know, police departments right by my house is a mile away is the Nassau County um, uh, Police Academy. They will open up courses also. Sometimes they'll invite civilians to come in and listen to, you know, different officers or attorneys speak. And you can get some some knowledge and say, ooh, that's changed. When I, I took another course uh, for a personal level and I said, oh, I took this course when I was 13. So let me take it again. And it was a DEA police officer speaking. And I was like, wow, I'm really glad I took this, this two night course because I learned a lot from that, you know, from what that officer was discussing when it came to, you know, specific types of laws. It's funny you say that too, because, you know, when you think of an instructor, um, for the most part, everybody thinks of someone who is doing the job or who has done the job. You know, I, I'll never forget. I had two really good courses. One was actually, um, performed by a lawyer you know they were talking about um, sexual harassment and you hear that and you're like oh man you know i gotta sit through this they literally had probably one of the best presentations i've had you know they talked a lot about you know why you shouldn't do it the legalities of it how to properly document and report it and investigate it it was such a great course um and that, that kind of training was so different than someone who was teaching it who worked in hr because hr is just you know don't do this don't do that sure. you're told not yeah, to do yeah, it don't yeah, do yeah. yes sure. um but the the lawyer just had um outlined everything in such great detail um you know just from a lot of different perspectives um as well as the mental health aspect of that as well you know people who see it how they process that in their brain i mean, it was a really really good course uh, the other one that I took, which is really great, two different people, two different instructors, um, first aid was conducted by a Red Cross instructor. It was really good. It was a good course. It was um, a basic, like an intro first aid. Uh, then I probably got like, you know, the Superman of uh, EMTs. Great guy. He'd been on the job for 10 years. Totally different course. He had so many cool pieces of equipment that he brought there. Yeah. Hands on. You can touch it. Hey, we're doing tourniquets this way. Uh, had a mannequin that would spit out, you know, like red water with, you know, dye his blood. Just so cool. Very interactive, you know, and it really said a lot to, to what he thought of putting into this training class and preparing. Um, really, really cool stuff.
What resources would you recommend to students looking into a class? I agree with you. DCJS has so many great things yes. on their calendar. <laughs> Um, the New York Office of Homeland Security, they're another one that has like so many different courses. A lot of them are free too. A lot of people don't realize that stuff is free. You go on that calendar, you can get some really good education yes. for little no cost. Little little to no cost. And you know, I try to I try to always just encourage uh just what you're saying, to look into other other resources. Um and I, I I'll even touch about jobs with them because sometimes people, you know, they, they they're sure. getting a they're getting, oh, you know what, now what do I do? You know, I got the license and I didn't know, you know, like anybody else, I didn't know anything about these sites. Or, but there's a lot of companies out there, I tell them, I like, said, so right now, the security industry is getting bigger and bigger. You know, look on Indeed.com or, you know, SideGig.com, which at that time was primarily yeah. for, for law enforcement. But they have, you know, not the easiest time I'll say even retaining officers. How about that? Yeah. They might yeah. get officers, but for whatever reasons, um, whether it's the officer themselves or whatever, you know, the retention level. So I said, so look into all of this. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say fashion weeks coming up. Um, religious high holy days. I did a lot of stuff. I would look into working at, you know, uh, synagogues and stuff. I worked that for, for, I worked at a couple of different synagogues for, for years and if you look read through the whole thing it'll say also civilians are welcome mm -hmm. and i had some civilian guards charlie that i that i learned a lot of stuff from i worked in malls and occasionally things might happen and i was so happy that i reach out to other people that know the head i knew the mall, the head of mall security and when there was a problem i had text i would text him and say there's a problem brewing you know in this area where i am and next thing you know i was never so happy because you've learned these resources if you just come to work and you don't look to advance a lot of bigger companies will offer other courses too i try to tell that to the class if you work for large-scale companies they will have conflict resolution online in person you have to constantly you know look in look into every resource you can there they're out there. Um, Homeland Security offers a lot of free courses. I tell people to look into. Um, you know, if it's uh, they, they give the the shoot. Uh, not part of the shoot. Don't shoot. It's uh, active shooter. Excuse active me. Active shooter. Active yeah. shooter. Very very important. And uh, you know, get some perspectives on how to to learn things. I'll just touch base real quick, brief if you don't mind about active shooter. My wife's a nurse at a large a large uh, city hospital. When things were going on, it was a retired officer. He was head of security for the entire hospital. He took his time to go from floor to floor to floor in this huge hospital and meet with groups of nurses to give them active shooter. Because at that time, these things did not exist online. So he gave them tips. And I said, but now you can reach out and you can see all of these scenarios, whether it's a warehouse you work in, hospital settings, because they all... Every job is going to vary. Power plants, whatever the case may be, you yeah, know. To, you know, to keep yourself abreast. Do you have resources a lot of times where you work. I tell them all the time. I worked in a power plant. They had clear manuals, and I said, and the Coast Guard would come and check and ask you questions. So make sure that you you utilize any resources that are out there to to help your base of knowledge. You know, here at Guardian Group Services, you know we had primarily focused just on um, the security guard training, you know, the eight pre the 16 hour OJT and the annual, right? Cause that's required for unarmed. Um, you know, we had expanded to do some OSHA training, which is very big, um, you know, in the construction industry mm -hmm. with the SST training, um, you know, we're an approved fire department school now and, and you kind of hit something as well um, with active shooter. Like it's in their curriculum now, you know, years ago it wasn't, it's, I don't want to say something new, but it's been more um, standardized and a more formal training, you know, um, how to deal with fire emergencies, how to deal with non-fire and how to deal with active shooter and medical emergencies. Very, very big. Um, you know, so one of the other things and you know, we talk about resources and training uh, at Guardian, we have an app now uh, for fire guard prep, which is really big for those individuals in uh, New York City that need to get the FO1 or the FO2 or the FO3 or FO4. 
um, you know, so feel free, folks, you know, if you're watching this live right now or later on, um, you know, send us an email. We're more than happy to talk to you, uh, give you resources and information. Our training calendar is listed on our website, uh, guardiangroupservices.com, 646-767-2477. Um, you know, last question, hardest one of the day. What has been your most memorable training class so far and why? <clears throat> well, <laughs> I try, you know what I try to do? I, I, as of when I first started out as an instructor, if I really got to help somebody who was struggling, um, and all of a sudden they got it because some people excel, you know, or they, or they'll have a natural ability to do a particular skill and it's no issue for them. Other people like learn at a different pace. So to try to, you know, not to be, you know, non-judgmental and, you know, work with that person. And then when they get it, you know, you feel that you, you really helped them. So I would say when I did that, this is, that was my most memorable class. What I try to do now when it comes to, you know, is try to make almost something a little bit memorable in, in, in almost each and every class you do, because it's what I like about training, particularly with the, with the guards a lot. It's a whole new group of people all the time. If I do these, even, you know, the, the zoom, whatever, you know, to constantly make sure I ask people, do you need me to go back over something? Is there anything you want me to, to go back on? Don't feel you don't, you can't answer. And then if they, I see their face like, oh, thank you, I understand. So to me, those little, those little things, every, every time I do something becomes like, becomes memorable that I, I, I want to, I want to do my best to, uh, to help them. That's what I try to put, you know, put out that that's what I'm here for. You, you know, know it, in this industry, um, you know, even as an instructor, right. I know we kind of get like a free pass for, um, our annuals, if you will. I like to go to other schools just to kind of see what they do and how they do it. Um, I mean, literally, I've seen some instructors literally, you know, pay the money. Here's your certificate. You're you're out of the door, yeah. uh, which is a no, no with DCJS. Oh, right? boy, you yes. can't do that. Right. Um, also, I've seen some pretty bad instructors. And I mean that, you know, just because they literally just, you know, take the PowerPoint and just, you know, read off the PowerPoint, you know, just this is what I said. And you're going to do it because I said so. like that's not right. training, um, you know, so I, I think, you know, having that interaction, you know, with the instructor and the student, um, making it a good training session, you know, for both parties, um, you know, for most people, they have to do some type of training for their job. So we want to make sure that we're keeping them safe, but also giving them the correct information on how to do uh, their job. Uh, John, it has been a pleasure. Thank uh, you. First oh, in the pleasure. many. Thank you for being number one today. Uh, oh, all the instructors you. here at Guardian were like ready to get in on this. Everybody's schedule is a little crazy. Everybody's teaching, but I know you're lucky to be off on Fridays. I've got to get back to work. <laughs> but I want to thank you, all of the guests, visitors, everybody that's watching now or later on. Thank you very much. And if you can, leave a comment. Let us know what type of training you would like to see us provide for you in the future. Uh, John, any parting words? No, I just I, I, I just wanted to say, you know, when it comes to the security industry, I think it's wide open right now. And the better officer you are and make yourself professional, it's going to really, really bolster this this industry. Mm -hmm. And people will really say, wow, you know, because the police every, you can't be there, you know, for, for everything. Security uh, positions are very important. And the more professional you are, the more you can elevate your own, elevate your own career. Absolutely. Many different paths um, that you can choose within this career. Um, thank you once again. Uh, today's episode, Meet the Instructors. Have a great